The diary of Norman Clegg aged 18 years. When my dad has any paint left, rather than waste it, he paints our gate. Everybody knows this and stays well clear of our gate, except for some reason, the postman, who cops it every time. It's always worth waiting for the postman. We don't get a lot of mail, but what we do get is sometimes very hard to put down. <laughs> Morning, Dad. Oh. oh, it's you. Norman. Oh. Has the paper come? I don't know about that, but you've got the postman. Well, you can come in. I've finished. I've, um, uh, I'm all done. There's no need to gallop. No, I was just going. We ought to have two bathrooms. I decorated a house once with two bathrooms, both with a mucky ring. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 uh. My dad's not a great one for conversation. <laughs> I think he'd be much happier as a member of the family if he lived somewhere close but not actually on the premises. <laughs> My dad doesn't say much, does he? Well, no. Your dad doesn't say much. Not to me, anyway. Your dad doesn't say much to anybody. It's not just me, then. No, silly. Of course it's not just you. Your dad's more of a thinker than a talker. You'd be surprised how deep your dad thinks. He doesn't let much of it out, does he? Well, no. He doesn't let much of it out. He decorated a house once with two bathrooms. Both with a mucky ring. <laughs> what kind of things does he think about, then? All kinds. Well, give me an example. They're beyond me. Are you pale this morning? Are you sure you've got enough colour? What colour did you have in mind? <laughs> My mother's a great warrior. Particularly this week, on account of the king and queen being somewhere at sea on their way to Canada. <laughs> she feels England's closed. There's nobody in. There's a letter here from your Auntie Ruth in Eastbourne. She's in service now in Eastbourne. A doctor and his family. They've got an Armstrong Sidley and a daughter studying in Paris. They have public conveniences that wouldn't make a decent fire guard. <laughs> Complete strangers can see your head and feet. <laughs> Eastbourne? I wish she wasn't so far from home, your Auntie Ruth. They give her all their old clothes. She can outdress the lot of us. But it's not like having a home of your own, is it? Why did she never marry me, Auntie Ruth? Oh, he was killed in the war. She still carries his photo. There's a Mr. Ibbotson writes to her, but he's going bald. <laughs> and how do you compete with a soldier that's never going to grow old? And anyway, he's not just bald. Mr. Ibbotson has to wear a flannel material on account of his skin condition. Sounds irresistible. <laughs> I don't wonder my Auntie Ruth went to Eastbourne. Well, I'm going to be off. Mind the gate. <laughs> Yesterday was army day in Italy. Not that Wally Batty cares. He's got his own problems. <coughs> Wally? How do, Cleggy? Listen, I don't want you to think I'm being excessively nosy. But what the heck are you doing? I mean, it's all exercises. Nora says I'm too small. For what? For Nora, for a start. 
So I've started doing my tall exercises. I reckon if I wear my heaviest boots and keep dangling from things, I'm gonna get taller, aren't I? Got crackers? Nora says that as well. <laughs> Do you want to pull up? No, I've another few minutes yet. Well, I, I can't wait here. I I've got to go to work. I'll be all right. <laughs> oh, well, as long as you're all right. Shabbat. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever understand lasses. True. And fathers. Fathers can be difficult. Mine can. And short people. There's some right putty short people about. <laughs> hey, here comes Grimshaw. Our Lord and Master, Mr. Scrimshaw, has a distinctive walk. It's a walk we all know too well. A walk we find much more attractive from the back. The sight of Mr. Scrimshaw going away from us is always a pleasure. That's done it now, Seymour. Missed him, didn't I? More fool you. Honestly. I think the roads would be much safer places if it weren't for old people loitering about. You've put him in a right mood now. He's going to be a pain for the rest of the day. He's a pain every day. There's some truth in that. Mm. There are three people seem determined to make life difficult for us. Hitler, Mussolini, and our Mr. Scrimshaw. And at the moment, our Mr. Scrimshaw is leading by a mile. Who do you think you are, lad? Malcolm Campbell? Didn't want to be late, Mr. Scrimshaw. Very commendable, lad, I'm sure. But I'd rather you did it by getting up five minutes earlier. I'm not disposed at my age driving three wheelers up my trouser leg. <laughs> but you can't leave it here. Not in front of society premises. You're the cameo of loveliness. Oh, what eyes you have, oh, what lips you have, oh, what lovely features. Talk about adorable creatures. You have so many thrillables, and I'm all out of syllables. From the top of your head to the tip of your toes, you're marvelous, glorious. You are simply divine. Top to tip, your tip top, but the top in all your mind. Shh. 
shirt, but What? Does your dad ever speak to you? He never stops. <laughs> what kind of things does he say? He says, do this, do that, get a move on with that. <laughs> Haven't you finished that job yet? Mine rarely speaks. I want us to hang on to him. Sounds like that's got a bargain there. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing. If war comes, I've an idea it's going to be disappointing. I don't see why. They spend a lot of money on it. All I can say is, I felt very let down at the gas mask they issued. That horrible little cardboard box. So undramatic. He wouldn't keep his sandwiches in it. <laughs> Is that what war is going to be like? Absolutely no glamour. Cardboard. One of the few places where we can hide from the eyes of our Mr. Scrimshaw is the cellar. It smells like something died down here. It's far too scruffy for the likes of Mr. Scrimshaw, who was something of a natty dresser in the manner of the late Dr. Crippin. <laughs> and so we're usually safe down here. It's a kind of unofficial staff clubhouse. We even have a grating to the street, through which we can admit the occasional passing guest. <laughs> oh, here's a sit down. I'm getting some ray tumpety from this left boot. It comes from never finding them in pairs. More usually one at a time. I've got the left boot of a right tight little twit house here. Oh. <laughs> Dear. What time flicks tonight, Denny Clegg? Well, we close at seven. If I gallop me tea, I just make the second house. What's on? Who cares? <laughs> Be good for me feet. <laughs> I can't stand him. He drives me mad. He drones on, he repeats himself. Oh! Scrimshaw! Oh, well, aye, that's got a problem, do you? Hey, up, Wally. Can somebody measure me? Oh, what? Again? <laughs> do it. I'm sure I'm taller. I definitely feel taller. Well, I don't look taller. I do from where I'm standing. <laughs> Well, I think you're nearly taller. And I'm doing all these stretching exercises. Is that it? <laughs> Is that the stretching exercises? Well, aye. Of course, it helps if someone pulls at their boots. All right, no bother. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if there's a war, I'll get taller. Nah, they'll be rationing. They'll get smaller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> Never go home for your dinner hour, Sherbert. Because me dad'd have me digging his allotment. I'm better off with a sandwich back at co-op. I fell off a bridge. <laughs> Serves me right for asking. <laughs> brush me up, not down. You brush me down, you'll stop me growing. You stopped when you were 12. I'm getting taller. Don't lie. You'll see. Be off with you. I've got work to do. Hang on a minute. 
take a good look at me face. What the heck for? I want you to recognise me when I do get taller. I don't want you to think I'm just some tall bloke passing by. On your way, Wally Batty. I'll see you tonight. Not if I see you first. Why don't you face up to it? It's destiny, thee and me. Well, that's a nice thing to say to a young woman on the threshold of life. Go on. Make a mark. I will. And it'll be where you don't show anybody. <laughs> My mother's worried today. She worries every day, but today she's making a special effort. It's my dad to blame. He's announced he's volunteered to help with air raid precautions. Why? Well, you said I ought to go out more. I meant for a drink or something, not air raid precautioning. Well, maybe we'll have a drink when it's finished. When what's finished? The air raid. <laughs> what will you have to do? Well, as far as I can tell, all we do is blow a whistle. In case there's a foul or something. That's very sporting. <laughs> Will they be dropping bombs on you? Well, not me personally. <laughs> At least, I mean, it never occurred to me that they might be after me personally. Well, what happens if they do? Oh, well, we've got this tin helmet. Tin? <laughs> is that all it is, tin? What metal attract bombs? Wouldn't you be better off with your old trilby or something? Are you coming to the pictures tonight, then, or not? I can't. I've got to help me dad on his allotment. What is he growing there? Bad-tempered, mostly. <laughs> you could come when it's dark. Oh, aye, I could come when it's dark. I'd miss half of it. Money grabber. How does it van? Will we have a fag? Bit forward, that Dillis. I never know where to put myself. Who's your Brad going out with these days? I don't know. He's gorgeous, there, Brad. He's all right. He's all right. I feel like blue eyes, curly hair, tall, athletic figure. But does he have boils? <laughs> well, don't stand there gawping. Go and get on with your work, or you'll have old Scrimshaw after us. We'll ever get the angle, lasses. I don't think I'm ever going to be an expert, but I think something must happen. How do you mean? Well, if you look at married people, they don't look any brighter than we are. <laughs> They're married, so something must happen. I suppose there comes a certain time in your life when everything sort of falls into place. You mean like waking up one morning and you can grow a moustache? I expect so. <laughs> Although, from all the fuss that's made about it, I suspect it ranges far more widely than just your upper lip. <laughs> I really hope so. I wish you would hurry up. Down. I, I never know what you're allowed to get hold of. <laughs> I'll tell you what you're allowed to get hold of. <clears throat> Look at him blushing. I don't know where you get it from, Norman Clegg. Your cousin Brad doesn't blush. He's good at football and all. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you sick. Sometimes I wish I didn't like him. Do you like lasses, Cleggy? Not especially. On account of I'm, I'm more or less in love with Merle Oberon. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Nobody ever seems to come in the co-op that looks like Merle Oberon. <laughs> and if one did, I'm sure she'd go for my cousin Brad. <laughs> Oh, not thee, missus. Next door. 
You're in good voice tonight. No good whispering, no. I don't think you'll ever be accused of that. Where are we going? We're going to call for Foggy. Oh! He's coming with us. Oh, he's such a pillock. He's eccentric, that's all. I like eccentrics. His heart's in the right place. Just his brain seems to be missing. <laughs> Get on your nerves. What? The musical boots. They're not bad boots, are these? I'm getting the knack of them now. I'd be amazed what people throw out. I bet you just wish they'd thrown a pair instead of two assorted sizes. <laughs> Can't remember the norm. Is that coming then? Keep your voice down. You know his mother's a bit proper. Ah, she ruins him. Was that you shouting in that common manner? Well, it's the only one I've got, missus. <laughs> Are you sure you ought to be going with friends like these? The other one's all right. I wish you could meet somebody nice. I'm a soldier, Mother. You have to mix with all kinds. <laughs> have you got your cough sweets? Will you keep your voice down, Mother? It's an army boot. Sounds like it was in the band. It's going to ruin his feet. He's not doing the pavement much good either. <laughs> hey, they're all right with these. They're like slippers now with these, or I? Well, like about three sizes too big. Don't forget your cough, sweets, Gladys. <laughs> she thinks I've got a weak chest. I keep telling them, Mother, I'm in the Territorial Army. How can I have a weak chest? Don't worry. It's a thing mothers have. They all think you've got a weak chest. Well, mine don't think I've got a weak chest. Not if you can lift boots that size, you can't have a weak chest. <laughs> aye, aye, Sherb. Messing about, there'll be some thick ears handed out. Aye, aye, Admiral. Come here in their Mexican uniforms, bossing our cinema queues. He's a bus driver during the day, takes bus loads of lasses to mills in Huddersfield. You can't trust these Mexicans. He's probably a white slaver, and they end up seeing a nightclub in Mexico City. In clogs and curlers? Bye, Mexico City is in for a treat. <laughs> There's bags of overtime in Mills or Huddersfield. They've got orders for miles of khaki cloth. Some of the best fighting khaki in the world. That looks a billikin down. The tunic isn't the right size. As soon as I can get a tunic that's the right size, I shall look fine. I wouldn't mind an officer's uniform. You have to be a leader of men. I know that. But have you got the killer instinct? Have we got the killer instinct, Norm? I had it somewhere. <laughs> well, I think my mum embroidered a cover for it. <laughs> Will someone change places? I don't know what I'm doing standing next to this long pillock. Well, if that changes places, he'll still be a long pillock. Do you mind? But he won't be a long pillock standing next to a little short pillock, will he? You've got a thing about being short, haven't you? Only because I am short. Only because Nora's tall. She's short on personality. That'll be all right, do you then?
Oh, do, Naga. Anywhere in the first ten rows. She spoke to me. <laughs> the royal family is to travel with their majesties to Portsmouth. But for London, it's the last personal contact with our king and queen for seven weeks. So goodbye and bon voyage. But the cameras are already at Portsmouth as the victory betters ship for the royal departure. At Portsmouth station, their majesties leave the train to receive the tribute of the port that has played such an important part in our maritime history. The King and Queen are received by the Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire and the Lord Mayor before walking across the cheering city square to the Guildhall for the ceremony of receiving the keys of Portsmouth Castle. A ceremony that is a token of the loyalty and love of their Majesty's island subjects, that same love and loyalty of which they will find fresh experience across the Atlantic. Do you think our Norman's got enough colour? And now we present the news and talks in German. Oh. This is the BBC national programme. Music by Romanian composers. No. Oh. <laughs> by the BBC Orchestra, Section D, conducted by Clarence Raybould. Yes, well, I, uh... I think I'll go to bed in English. <laughs> That's too small to attract her attention in stalls. What if she's down in the stalls? How the heck am I going to attract her attention from up in the balcony? think this is a good idea. Uh, terrific. She's bound to notice him when that comes in from this unexpected angle. That's probably true. I hope there's no one in from my social set. They'd be appalled to see me messing about like this. Just grab hold of his left boot. And keep hold. Sounds like a good idea. Target approaching. Is that sure it's Nora? Who else is down there with a the door? I don't want to go through all this for a Mexican admiral. <laughs> you care for a Pontifrac cake, Nora? <laughs> you've learned about Nora. She really doesn't like Pontifrac cakes. <laughs> <laughs> 